We left off at verse 6. We left off at verse 6. We talked about in our previous Genesis studies about capital punishment at verse 5 and how the Lord uh, views capital punishment into producing a better society. And of course, there are these uh, more complicated cases in legal matters about, well, what if a person accidentally killed somebody or he wasn't with the right intention, maybe his mental condition wasn't on par and as severe as other people and etc. I've already explained all those uh, things and those complexities in our last Genesis study. The scripture gave an answer for that one. The problem with today's society is that they try to g give more leniency toward crime and by doing that what happens is this is the result you get today. Then there's no hard rule anywhere. See that? The point is there has to be a hard rule. We are open to complex matters and the Bible shows and demonstrates a few cases that I told you. However, it doesn't change the fact that we cannot negate hard and fast rule. There has to be a hard and fast rule at the same time being open to a complex area and then you get a balance of the law and society. But when you go one extreme or the other extreme, then it becomes chaotic. Let's look at verse 6. Verse 6. So again, God explains capital punishment here. Whoso sheddeth man's blood. So that means anybody who sheds the blood of mankind, so that's a metaphorical expression for killing somebody, by man shall his blood be shed. So God's saying that that same man who killed a different man, his blood has to be shed as well. Uh, let me know if by angling here that I just make it worse, okay? So, so notice right here, whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. For in the image of God made he man. So it's important to understand that in the past, remember at Genesis 1, God created man in his own image. So go back to Genesis 1 if you forgot that, all right? Genesis chapter 1. When God created mankind, he created them in his own image. And that's the reason why God takes life very seriously and he demands capital punishment when somebody takes away a life because of what he did in the past. In verse 26, And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness. So God created man in his own image. So because man is created in the image of God, at the beginning, the Lord takes life very seriously. Now you notice how I said it. I said at the beginning. Because remember at Genesis chapter 5, you can turn over there, all right? But you already learned that before, so you don't have to, but you can turn over there just in case to double check. Remember, mankind lost the image of God. That is found at Genesis chapter 5. Now notice at verse 1, God created man in his image, right? Genesis 5, 1. So the Bible words that carefully. But then it words it carefully, and Genesis chapter 5 and verse 3, Genesis 5, 3, that what follows after Adam is not God's image, but man following Adam's image. So Genesis 5, 1 made a distinction with Genesis 5, 3. You notice that? So we see the clear distinction that this was in the beginning. But then after the fall, we see that mankind lost the image of God. And so they followed the image of Adam. So man currently is in the image of Adam. Following Adam's image, this would mean that currently lost human people are not in the image of God. So there are some people who might be confused when you look at Genesis chapter 9 and verse 6, God saying don't take away a human life. Why? Because man is created in the image of God. The simple answer to that is God was taught, uh, notice the past tense right here at verse 6, Genesis 9, 6, in the image of God, what? 
made. So he's talking about when he made man at the beginning. That's pretty obvious. That's obviously not referring to today. God made man in his image today. That's referring to the past here. So God's saying, because of what I did in the past with mankind, where I created them in his image, that's the reason why I take this very seriously. So do not take a life. All right, let's go back here. I'm going to go to Genesis 9-7. Genesis 9-7. Now, I'm not going to show you all the verses proving that we are not in the image of God today, except those who are saved in Christ. I already taught you in my previous Genesis studies. So uh, just look in our previous Genesis studies. And for people who are very immature online and then they throw in a comment and they said, well, how do you know that? What are the scriptures to prove it? You don't know what you're talking about. I don't have time to go through those verses, all right? I keep saying previous Genesis studies. So don't be so immature to do that. And why don't you look back in the other videos? Or maybe you're just too lazy to do it and you just want to throw in a comment. All right, that's what typical onliners do, okay? All right, let's go to Genesis 9-7, Genesis 9-7. And you be ye fruitful. So God demands Noah and the rest of his offspring. He says, be fruitful. All right, so producing fruit. We know that's the expression meaning to, re, uh, to produce more children. And multiply. So multiply means, you know, not just add, but multiply. So one times one times one, two times two, etc. So you just spread out children. Those are the words to express about producing children. Bring forth abundantly in the earth and multiply therein. So bring forth abundantly, a lot, all over the earth, in the earth. Therein, there in the earth, you multiply. That's the idea. So God, notice at Genesis 9, 6, and 7, he doesn't want mankind to kill each other off. He wants mankind to spread out and to fill up the earth. So that is important to understand. So God wants people to naturally produce their offspring, and he doesn't like it when they take away life. Now, that's important to understand. You can see here, that God takes life very seriously. So life, he wants it to spread out. He wants it to add. He wants it to multiply. He doesn't want it when life is subtracted. You notice that there? He doesn't like it when life is subtracted. Now, if you know a little bit about conspiracies, for example, you know there's a group of elites out there that don't want the popul... Uh, they have a thing about an issue with overpopulation. They want population control. So then in order to do it, they like to wipe out the population. And that's the reason why they do these current endeavors to try to limit or to try to eliminate or kill off the population. And you know the specifics on that one. So they are the ones who are in violation of Genesis 9, 6, and 7. They have been in violation of God's covenant all the way back to the beginning of beginnings. Not even today, not even the beginning of the church age, but beginning of beginnings. That is a satanic mindset, you know. So satanic mindset is when they always violate God's covenant. Where they violate God's covenant? Plan of a, a one soul redeemer, Messiah, Genesis chapter 3, right? There's your covenant that God made with mankind. They don't like that. They violated that one. The Noahic covenant right here. They want to wipe out population. And then they have an antagonism against the children of Israel. How about that for conspiracies, right? They think that you have to be anti-Semite so that you can be against the elites. No, that is an elitist globalist mindset. The third covenant is about the Jewish people. Globalist mindset is to wipe out that Jewish population. They do it under the pretense of being friends of Israel, but that's what the Antichrist does. He makes a covenant with the Jews. He is from their offspring. But then like Judas Iscariot, no hesitation to betray. That, like you get with Soros, for example, right? And a lot of other cases. So we see that uh, Jewish elites, it's not a surprise. And then we see it. I would challenge people to look at every covenant in the Bible. I, I would see an elitist violating nearly every covenant in the Bible. So that's the devil's job. That's a satanic mindset. I'm going to give some examples here about shedding of blood throughout history. I'm reading from Dr. Upman's Genesis commentary on page 238. I'm also going to give some verses, 
And I would encourage you to write some of these verses down that he's going to mention. These, this is a lot of gold here. We don't have time to look at all these verses. He says here, Whoso sheddeth man's blood, uh, by man shall his blood be shed. Isaiah chapter 26, verse 21. Isaiah chapter 26, verse 21 is the final reaping of man for a series of actions which began with Genesis 4 and will not end until Revelation 19. Note the peculiar emphasis on blood in the Holy Bible that is missing from the other great scriptures of the world, so-called scriptures. Number one, the first blood shed is the blood of a lamb. Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3. Number two, the second blood shed is that of a shepherd, keeper of sheep, lamb. Genesis chapter 4. Genesis chapter 4. The good shepherd of John 10 sheds blood. That's Jesus Christ in John chapter 10. And Colossians chapter 1. Colossians 1 verse 14. Verse 14. The Christian has peace through his blood. Colossians 1.20, Colossians 1.20, justified by this blood, Romans 5.9, Romans 5.9, is cleansed by this blood, 1 John 1.7, 1 John 1.7, is redeemed by this blood, Ephesians 1.7, Ephesians 1.7, is purged by this blood, Hebrews 9.14, Hebrews 9.14, and is saved by this blood. Ephesians 2.13, Ephesians 2.13. All right, play, uh, when this goes up online, I guess press rewind. Now, number f uh, so this is number four. The Christian has peace uh, through his blood, redemption by his blood, saved by his blood, and all that good stuff. Three is the good shepherd. Late sheds blood. Two, the second blood shed is that of a shepherd. Number one, the first blood shed is a lamb. Number five, Judas goes to the field of blood. Judas goes to the field of blood. Acts 119. Acts 119. Pilate tries to get innocent blood off his hands. That's number six. Matthew 27, 24. Matthew 27, 24. Number seven, Mystery Babylon is guilty of the blood of saints and martyrs. That's Revelation 17. Revelation 17, verse 5 and verse 6. Verse 5 and verse 6. Number eight, Babylon's followers drink blood. That's Revelation 16.6. 6. Revelation 16.6. 6. Blood is forbidden in both Testaments, Old and New Testaments. Uh, the verses were given at our previous chance to study, so I'm not going to give it here, all right? So that one is number uh, nine, number nine. Blood is forbidden in both Testaments. Number 10, Christ's garment at the second advent is dipped in blood. That's Isaiah 63, Isaiah 63. Revelation 19, Revelation 19, verse 13, verse 13. Old Testament and New Testament are instituted with blood. Both Testaments are. That's Hebrews chapter 9, verse 8 through 22. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 8 through 22. Innocent blood is always avenged, all right? That's Matthew chapter 23, verse 35. Matthew chapter 23, verse 35. And 2 Kings chapter 9, verse 26. 2 Kings chapter 9, verse 26. All right, so uh, I forgot to mention the number. So 9, blood is forbidden in both testaments. 10, Christ's garment is dipped in blood at the second advent. 11, both, institutes, uh, both testaments are instituted with blood. Number 12, innocent blood is always avenged. Number 13, the Christian will dip his feet in blood at the second advent. That's Psalms chapter 58, verse 10. Psalms chapter 58, verse 10. <coughs> Psalms chapter 58, verse 10. 
Psalms chapter 68, verse 23. Psalms chapter 68, verse 23. Dr. Upman continues, so this is number 13, the Christian will dip his feet in blood. All right, so that's all. Dr. Upman now says, in more than 350 verses, if you want to write that down, go, to, go ahead, more than 350 verses, the word appears, blood, uh, blood, blood, blood. The Bible is a bloody book. And it capstones the bloody account of man's bloody history with the statement that the blood shed on Calvary was more than a man's. Amen. It was God's blood. Yeah. Wow. Uh, looks like uh, he had more sense than John MacArthur, right? All right. <laughs> Acts chapter 20, verse 28. That's a passage if you want to write it down. Acts chapter 20, verse 28. That was God's blood, not man's blood. Dr. Rotman says, now watch all the new translations rush to change that verse. Well, no wonder John MacArthur did. Yeah, he approves of different modern Bible versions. That would make a lot of sense. Okay, let's go back to Genesis 9. All right, you had a good study on blood just now. If I went through all of that, then it would take too much time. So... One important case that you have to understand that we learned is blood is all over the Bible. The Bible is a bloody book. Let's look at Genesis chapter 9 and verse 8. And God spake unto Noah and to his sons with him, saying... All right, so that's self-explanatory. God speaks to Noah... And then to Noah's children, who follow along with Noah, saying, so God's about to speak, and I, behold, so uh, let me keep reading, I, behold, I establish my covenant with you, and with your seed after you. So again, that's self-explanatory. God's saying, I, behold, that means, look, uh, lo and behold, hey, do I get your attention? Look. I establish. So he establishes what? His own covenant with Noah and with his seed after, that take after Noah. So Noah's seed after him. So his offspring. And with every living creature that is with you, of the fowl, of the cattle, and of every beast of the earth with you. So God's saying, not just Noah and his seed after him, but every, any creatures that is alive with Noah. So those that survived with Noah through the flood went with him in the ark. That includes fowl, which is bird, cattle, so that's all cattle, livestock, and any beast that you find on the earth. Now, notice the interesting wording here at the last part of verse 10. From all that go out of the ark to every beast of the earth. Now, notice that. God says any creature, living creature, that is alive, that went out of the ark with you, from there to what? To any other beast that's on the earth. What the, that's implying something then. So we're seeing another indication here. We're seeing another indication here that there are animals that God made a covenant with those who went in the ark and went out of the ark with Noah. But then there are those who didn't join Noah on the ark, it seems like. So there seems to be two cases here. So one on the ark the other one, the rest of them that are on the earth. So it may be, like I pointed out to you before, if those sons of God did survive, and the Nephilim did survive, this may be one of the passages to indicate that. Why? Because there are those who, I give, given some wild theories, and some that seemed very plausible, not those that are just wild, but those that are very plausible, where the offsprings of the sons of God, the Nephilim and these people, they tried to survive. They probably flew out of there. They went up to outer space. Or they dug someplace really deep underground, which is why when you go to those caves and terrain, there are some interesting drawings over there about the giants. And they may have uh, escaped through the sea. Why? Because Noah's Ark didn't have an aquarium. So there are sea creatures who survived. And you know that the lowest point in our world would be at the bottom of the ocean, which is close to the depths of hell itself. And you'll see that case at Jonah chapter 2. 
So there are plenty of examples right here where we can see that, it, that there's a good chance that the Nephilim did survive Noah's flood, and this might indicate that, concerning about from those that went out of the ark with Noah to those that are remaining on the earth. So take it what it is. The one that would probably debunk that point, though, would be at verse 11, verse 11. And I will establish my covenant with you. Again, that's self-explanatory. God say, okay, now I'm going to establish, make a covenant with you, promise with you. Neither shall all flesh be cut off anymore by the waters of a flood. So this seems to point out right here that any flesh that was on the earth, they did die out by Noah's flood. So let me explain word for word. Neither shall all flesh be cut off anymore. So uh, he's saying that not even any flesh or any physical entity is going to be cut off. That's, they're going to be destroyed uh, anymore by the waters of a flood, by the fl Noah's flood. So that's what he's pointing out over here. So we see several cases here on some interesting pointers about how the Nephilim survived and how they went through uh, the flood. But then verse 11 might seem to debunk that. But then you'll notice right here, if I, like I pointed out to you before, these, this is referring to all flesh that's on the earth, right? So then what about those that have escaped to outer space? What about those that went below the earth, right? Like really deep in the heart of the earth, where close to hell. Maybe they did go down to hell. What about those who uh, escaped through the sea? So it gives a lot of, still leaves a lot of open possibilities to study concerning about the survival of the Nephilim. Now, there is one interesting thing that I want to point out to you, is that God, he made a covenant with Noah and his offspring. That's, notice that at verse 11, right? And then he seems to point out here that flesh is no longer on the earth. All right, so any flesh that has access to the earth or that is open on the earth, right? It was cut off. It's gone. Huh. And then God points out over here that the only ones that seem to be over there is Noah and his people, right? So then, if it's only his seed, then the other, any other seeds are gone on the earth that's open on the earth. I'm not talking about those who escape that got out of the earth. I'm talking about those that are open on the earth, okay? The other seeds, they should have been gone. Wait a minute. Remember what I taught you about uh, it might be possible about what? That there were other offsprings of Adam that may have been still in the Garden of Eden that time. Remember I taught about that? Uh, I'm not going to get into that, all right? Because it's just going to take a long time. But remember what I taught you, that God, God kicked out Adam and Eve, but then Adam's children, they may have had children at the Garden of Eden, because during their fall, it seemed to indicate that they're, they're going to produce more other children. Okay, so I'm not going to get into that. If you're interested, just look at my previous Genesis studies. But if Adam's other offspring did exist, I keep saying if, all right? So don't take it as doctrine. If they did exist and they were at, uh, and they were at uh, the Garden of Eden, remember, they were at the Garden of Eden, then in this passage of Genesis 9, it seems to show that they're no longer in existence. So then God cut off all access. Why? Because there's no open place in the earth that there should be flesh. God made sure it's cut off by the waters of a flood. So why am I pointing out right over here? The Garden of Eden, it could have been gone during the time of Noah's flood then. This is where we get the idea the Garden of Eden disappeared during the time of Noah's flood. Why would we say during the time of Noah's flood? Because at Genesis chapter uh, 4... No, Genesis 3, excuse me, Genesis 3. You can turn back over there. Genesis chapter 3. 
And then verse 24, it seems to show that the Garden of Eden was still in existence, right? So Genesis chapter 3, verse 24, it seems to show that the Garden of Eden was still in existence that time. God just wanted to block it. But then he mentioned over here that the flesh is cut off now on the earth. So then that should show that the waters of the flood blocked every other access. Now here's the, another interesting thing that I showed you before. What I showed you before is that what is possible is that because it's a flaming sword that blocks off, I'm not going to turn to all those verses, all right? I did in my previous chance to study, which was intensely interesting, so I'm not going to do it here, okay? Because I just don't have time. And plus, I taught it before, so I don't want to repeat it, okay? So remember, the flaming sword was what blocked the Garden of Eden, right? Now, when's, uh, what's the other time God did a flaming sword? That's the second advent, when he comes down, I show you the passages. Sword comes out of his mouth, it's a flaming sword. But guess what? It's set on fire of hell. It puts hell on earth. That happens in the future. So then, that's the, if that's what it's mentioned in the Bible when you compare Scripture with Scripture, God puts a flaming sword in the Garden of Eden, which is why it's a hell on earth, remember. So then, like I taught you at Genesis 3, it's possible it was a hell on earth, so God covered the Garden of Eden with what? Hell fire. And I showed you a passage at Ezekiel that those trees of Eden, it said it went down to hell. It said that. All right, I'm not going to show it to you again. So then, if this was open, because when you read Genesis 3, it shows that it's open. People can still go back and forth. That's why God had to block it, right? So it was open for people to see. It was on the earth. But then at Genesis 9, we're seeing that God says flesh is cut off, everything cut off by the waters of a flood, and points out that it seems only Noah and his people are the only ones on the earth. So that means then that the waters of a flood, that would be the timing of when... The waters of the flood, because it changed the landscape, right? If it changed the landscape, we do know this. Hell on earth, is, it's not there anymore. Hell is not on earth. We know where hell is, right? It's down below. It's covered. So the waters of the flood, where it changed our what? Our ge everything going on around the landscape, Mountains were coming out, right? Canyons were being formed. So it's not a problem. God can just cover up the Garden of Eden like that because it's already covered in eternal hellfire. But now he just covers it a little bit more below now. So now it's underground. So it could be that Adam's other offspring and then the Garden of Eden that was used to be on hell on earth, it's now below. It's now below. So that's just some interesting stuff uh, to think about. And that's what, the reason why I told you about the mysterious identity of Mephibosheth and everything. It could all be tied over there. But again, like I, taught, uh, like I told you, this isn't doctrine. This isn't doctrine. This is just some interesting things in the Bible. What we are as Bible believers is we're unafraid to study more into the book and find anything in the Bible that would encourage us to study and research more. All right, that's what the mindset of a Bible believer is. We study, all right? But we don't make it into like a, if it's something like wild and stuff like that, like you're hearing right now, you know, let's admit this is wild. We're not going to make it into a doctrinal issue and ma make a big ruckus over it or, fu or fight over something like this. If you want to fight over something stupid like this, then be my guest, all right? <laughs> all right. So that's how we encourage studying more into the Bible but not turning it into a divisive issue, all right? Amen, now let's go to, that's the problem with the non-line mentality. I know that I kick onliners quite often, but this is so important because uh, you onliners, you don't, a lot of you don't have a Bible-believing pastor or a Bible-believing church, so I'm pretty much the only one trying to tell you, all right? I'm trying to protect you guys. The mindset is you study so much weird, crazy stuff online that you all disagree with each other that it turns into a big fight, right? All right, let's go to Genesis chapter 9. All right, Genesis chapter 9. Well, that was a lot of fun, right? That was a lot of fun. 
The last part of verse 11, it seems to support the pointer over here about if there was a hell on earth with the Garden of Eden and Adam's other offspring, that uh, it's wiped out. Read the last part of verse 11. Neither shall there any more be a flood to destroy the earth. So God's saying, I'm not going to send a flood anymore that will uh, destroy the earth. So the earth has been destroyed by the flood. Let's, uh, hmm. I'll read. We'll keep reading and then I'll explain the other parts. Verse 12. And God said, this is a token of the covenant which I make between me and you. So, God's about, to, when he makes a covenant, he wants to give them a token, okay? So sometimes when people make promises, they give like evidence or a token or some kind of object, right? So that's the idea God's making with them. So this is the evidence of my promise with you. Between me and you and every living creature that is with you. So God's saying between me, you Noah, and every creature that is alive with you, that followed along with you Noah, I made a promise to all of them for perpetual generations. So it's going to go on perpetually throughout generations. So that means it's going to go on forever. So this is God's eternal covenant. I do set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be for a token of a covenant between me and the earth. So God, he sets, uh, he sets up a bow. So we get your rainbow here. So God sets up a rainbow in the cloud, that's why out of the clouds we see rainbows. And whenever, and the, it shall be, what? So that rainbow is going to be that token of the covenant. This is God's token of his covenant. So when God made a promise to Noah, we got to realize this is God's token of that promise to us. Uh, that he made between us and the earth. So God made a promise to the earth as well. So you notice that God, uh, your God's a very reasonable God. He does think about not just humans, but he thinks about his creation as well. And I've given you plenty of examples that, you know, your God is much more beneficial, more gracious than the liberal environmentalists of today. I showed you verses on that one, all right? I pointed out creeping things, right, at last chance to study, how God was gracious, beneficial toward insects creeping things. You don't, see, you don't see these Berkeley graduates doing that. No, they crush every cockroach that's in their dorm right now, I guarantee, while being hypocritical about preserving animals' rights. That's them being elitist, picking which animal they like to preserve. That sounds pretty Calvinist then, don't you think so? They're picking and choosing. They're electing which one they could save, which one could be damned, so to speak. And they're the ones who hypocritically accuse our God of being a Calvinist, picking and choosing which one goes to heaven and hell. We even disagree with Calvinists on that one. Really funny, right? The, the, the mind of the world is very distorted. All right. So God is a very uh, gracious God toward his creation, not just toward uh, humans. And it's the rainbow. And it shall come to pass. All right, so God's saying it's going to... Uh, so that's a metaphorical expression. You know what that means. It's going to come to pass... What's going to happen when I bring a cloud over the earth that the bow shall be seen in the cloud? All right, you, that's self-explanatory, right? When God brings that cloud on the earth, the bow is going to be seen in the cloud. So you notice that God was way ahead of the scientists at Genesis 9, 14 about how rainbow and clouds and all that work. God already knew that a long time ago in the B.C.s, right? At verse 14, God already knew all the way at the B.C.s. That clouds have to do something with rainbow. So your God's a very scientific God. And I will remember my covenant, which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. So God's saying that uh, whenever he sees that rainbow, he's going to remember his promise. What? What was his promise? Remember verse 11? I'm not going to send a flood anymore that will wipe out all of uh, mankind and destroy the earth. I'm going to remember that promise I made between me and then you, Noah, and his offspring, and any other creature that is alive of all flesh, any flesh that's on the earth. God's going to remember that covenant. So that's a wonderful promise, and you notice then your God's a gracious God. Let's, we're going to look at two passages on that, Romans 2 and 2 Peter 3. We're going to look at Romans chapter 2. 
I want you to look at Romans chapter 2 and then 2 Peter chapter 3. So then you get a bunch of these sodomites right now that uh, take God's token and plaster it on themselves and then they disgrace and blaspheme God with this symbol through their lifestyle. Now you know what that is? That is pure wickedness. You know what they're doing? They're taking God's mercy and grace where, remember, originally because of mankind's sin, what did God do? Because of originally mankind's sin, God drowned them with the flood. And then here are a bunch of these sodomites parading about their sin, and God can't send that flood because of his promise, so he looks at that rainbow, and at the same time, these sinners do more disgrace to God by saying, hey, let's make him angry more. Let's take his promise of his symbol that he's not going to wipe us out and plaster it on our sin. Wow. Do you know how wicked that, of a mindset that is? That's purely evil. That's purely evil. That's pure evil. It's, I mean, that makes God even more angry. So, you know, what I'm, you know what I'm telling you? Sometimes, here's something that might even convict Christians, all right? When, when you see these sodomite parades and then preachers going out on the streets, a lot of them can be jerks, but some of them are genuinely good people preaching against their lifestyle. But the thing is this, you'd be surprised how much more God is gracious than to you who preaches at their sin at the sodomite parades. You might say, really, what is it? Because the flesh gets easily tempted to have even righteous indignation when you see their sin paraded. I'm telling you, I can't tell you details, but there are details that is totally grotesque that they do it publicly in the parade. And I'm not going to tell it to you because it's just too grotesque, okay? So they do that in public, and when you see that, you can't help but get right righteous. I'm not talking about even fleshly, but righteous indignation. Guess what? God don't even do that on them. Why? Because of that promise. He's way more gracious and loving than even we can be toward the Sodomites. That's how gracious your God is. And you criticize him about, what, burning in hell forever and other stuff you can blame God? I don't get that. I really don't get that. You got fried eggs in your brains. Let's look at Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2. We're going to look at verse 3. Now, this is an important verse, and it should put the fear of God in you, all right? It's not just lost people. I want saved Christians to look at this too. Romans 2, 3. And thinkest thou this, O man, that judgest them which do such thing and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance? So see that? Even you, in the midst of your sin, trying to escape God's judgment, he is incredibly merciful to you. And God, what he does with your sin is that he tries to blind it out. And instead, what he does is when you sin, he tries to show you goodness instead. And you might go, why would God shed goodness instead? The reason why God would shed goodness is that he's hoping it can lead you to repentance. You can repent after that. So then, if, if you see more and more how God is gracious and merciful to you, shouldn't that put more of an appreciation that, okay, God, I, I know what I did was wrong. I'm sorry. I feel guilty. I feel messed up. I feel rotten. I want to repent. I want to change. I want to quit my lifestyle, right? But they don't even have that kind of fear, these people. They don't even have that kind of fear. Instead, they whine, they moan, they make excuses, and they keep blaming God. That's something. You know what happens when you despise his goodness? His long-suffering don't go forever. What happens is it stores up more wrath against them. So every time that this symbol goes out and you plaster sin at the same time, you know what God's doing? He's building up greater hell fire. You don't believe me? Look at verse 5. But after thy hardness and impenitent heart, treasurest up unto thyself wrath. See, you're storing up, you're building up your treasures in hell. You're not just laying up treasures in heaven. Didn't you know you can lay up treasures in hell? There's a verse right here. Lay up for yourselves treasures in hell. Amen, amen, amen. All right. 
Look at right here. You can treasure up your, uh, lay up your treasures in hell. It builds up more wrath. Against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to every man according to his deeds. See, God recalls all the deeds and actions you've done. And he's giving you his goodness. But what it's doing at the same time, it's building up more of his wrath every time you reject it. One thing I learned, you don't gamble with God's grace. People keep talking about you. You know, you Christians think you're saved by grace through faith alone and not by works, and you can sin and do whatever you want. We don't teach that. Who's the idiot who would teach that? Yeah. All right? You know, who's the idiot who would teach that? All right? We're just being honest that, yeah, even if I sin, uh, I'm still saved by grace through faith. You might say, why? Because it's not what I do. Then I'm disgracing Jesus' work. I have to look only at his work. But then, at the same time, I'm not going to play with his grace. You might say, why? The reason why is I don't want to get my head busted. If you want to get your head busted, go ahead, be my guest. I mean, uh, talk to the people here. I don't know how long you've been saved, but if you've been saved for years, I guarantee every one of you who've been saved for years, you've tasted something from God, and it's not pretty. Okay? It's not pretty. And sometimes he teaches you the hard way. Why? Because you're that person who's hard-hearted at verse 5. And finally, he busts up your head, and then you get the memo. All right, uh, Romans chapter 2, we see here at verse 4 that this is called long-suffering. It's not only his goodness, it's also referred to as long-suffering. Why? Because God has to suffer for a long time. He has to bear and put up with that thing for a long time. And yeah, maybe even just suffer itself. Has to go through the pain. Why? Because the Bible talks about Ephesians 4.30, grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed to the day of redemption. See, you can hurt God with your sin. So in this long suffering, look at 2 Peter 3. This is a great verse that matches up with Genesis 9 about God's promise. When God made that promise to Noah, it's not like Noah said to God, well, I'm so glad, Heavenly Father, that you're not going to judge this world again. And God's like, no, 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 Noah, you, you didn't pay attention. That's not what I said. But Lord, you just said every time that you see a rainbow, you're never going to judge this wicked world again. I never said that. I'm not going to judge this world by water anymore. And Noah was like, well, good night then. What are you going to judge this world with? And God says, fire. And Noah's like, nope. Oh, well, uh, thank you, Lord, for your wonderful promise anyway that you're not going to send the water. <laughs> yeah, so if you listen to Dr. Upman's ad-lib commentary, it's, a, it's really funny on that one. You know. But actually, that is very true. There's a lot of truth in that one because when God gave his long, this is his long suffering here, okay? His promise of mercy. But the passage shows you that while God is being long suffering and delaying that rapture, delaying his coming, why? He's trying to put off his judgment. He's trying to go by this as long as he can. Yep. All right? Yep. He's trying to do this as long as he can by not sending the water. And then he wants to put that judgment of fire at the end. So he wants to put it like really at the end. Why? Because he wants to be merciful to these people. Yeah. He wants to be gracious. So yes, God made a promise. He's not going to judge this world by water. But that don't mean that he's never going to judge this earth again. He's going to judge this earth by fire. Let's look at 2 Peter chapter 3. Verse 7, verse 7. But the heavens and the earth which are now, by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. You see that? So God says right here that the earth... He's reserving it for judgment. Why did he put a reservation? Like he put a delay because he's trying to be long-suffering. See that? Yeah. Romans 2. He remembered his covenant with Noah, Genesis 9. So he's trying to uh, reserve it, delay it. That's why I look at verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness. So God is not slack. He's not slacking off on his promise of coming again. It's talking about his coming again at verse 4. Verse 4. The Bible says, where's the promise of his coming? See that? So it's talking about his coming. So the reason why God delays the rapture is what? 
He's trying to be long-suffering so that any soul can get saved. Yes. Amen. So I believe in that, uh, in some, some of what the preachers say, that the reason why God delayed the rapture is because he wants to make sure every soul gets a chance to get saved. I believe that. Why? Because there is scriptural evidence. 2 Peter 3, 4 and 9. Keep reading 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise. That's his rapture. That's his coming. And remember, when he comes, he brings the fire, right? Why? Because he's being long-suffering. Keep reading. But is long-suffering to us, word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. See that? See, God wants everybody to repent. If they don't repent, look at verse 10. Notice it's fire. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up, seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved. That should scare the tar out of you. God's going to burn up everything and wipe everything out like an atomic bomb. Peter says, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness? <laughs> you know that language, what Peter's saying right here? So because God's going to send a, a bomb that's greater than the atomic bomb, that's scarier than the atomic bomb, let's all be holy in all manner of conversation. <laughs> all right, let's go back to Genesis 9. Genesis 9. Genesis chapter 9. And then we'll look at verse 15 again. So God makes a promise that he's, knowing, he, uh, he's not, excuse me, he's not. Genesis 9, 15, he's not going to send a flood of waters that will destroy the earth. He makes that promise. We'll read the last part of verse 15. And the waters shall no more become a flood to destroy all flesh. So the waters that are currently on the earth, God's saying it's no longer going to become a flood. That will wipe out all of humanity. Now, this is a great proof text right here that shows, let's assume this is talking about a normal local flood. You think that's what God meant at uh, verse 15? The waters aren't going to become, grow up to a point where it's never going to become a flood again. No, God didn't mean that. He meant it's never going to become a flood that will wipe out all of humanity. That's what I read right there, right? So God never said that he's going to denounce local flood. It's a universal flood. It is a worldwide flood. Now, why is that important? Because you got some dumb intellectuals, really dumb intellectuals, they'll try to rationalize the Bible and Genesis. And you hear this in liberal schools, too. They always try to make it a local flood. And then they'll try to tell you, well, it's a local flood. It's not a worldwide flood that just changed the topography, geography, and everything all around us. No, it did change everything. Because then God violated his promise. God said, I'm never going to send waters that will become a flood. That's a lie then. We had, uh, we had hundreds, if not thousands of that. Floods, flood, flood, flood. So then God is a liar. He really don't know what he's talking about. Or this is a universal worldwide flood. So Genesis 9, uh, 15 is your proof text that you want to use. It is the proof text that shows that God's flood was worldwide, universal. It was definitely not local. If your professor says it's local, he's loco, okay? Let's go back here, all right? Loco professors teach local floods. I think that should be a meme, maybe, okay? Okay, let's go to verse 16. Let's look at verse 16. And the bow shall be in the cloud, and I will look upon it. So that's common. We know that out of the cloud you're going to see a bow, right? So that rainbow, and God's going to look at it. That I may remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is upon the earth. So notice right here that God says he's going to look at that rainbow and he's going to remember an everlasting covenant. That's a forever promise that he made. It's the forever promise he made between what? God and any creature that's alive of all flesh that is on the earth, that is around the earth. Now, you'll notice that God referred to himself in the third person as God. You notice that? 
He didn't say I right here. He says between God and every living creature. You might say, why would God do that? Because he probably would like to refer to himself as a third person trying to tell people that I'm God. <laughs> I am God. So there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that. Sometimes even myself, I would refer to myself as a third person because I'm just weird. I don't know why. But sometimes I would do that in the third person. But there's nothing wrong with that. There are sometimes people who can refer to themselves in third person. Now, we see right here that God, he has that rainbow. And why he does that rainbow is because he did that a long time ago. We're going to look at two passages. We're going to look at uh, Revelation 4. Revelation 4. Revelation 4. And then we're going to look at Genesis, uh, not Genesis, we're going to look at Ezekiel 1. Ezekiel 1. We're going to look at uh, Genesis 4. And then we'll turn to Ezekiel chapter 1. We're going to go to Ezekiel chapter 1 and Genesis 4. Uh, yeah, Revelation, excuse me, yeah. Revelation 4 and Ezekiel 1. There we go, thank you. Revelation 4 and Ezekiel 1. All right, notice right here that God puts a rainbow up in heaven. So, that, so that's not anything new to the Lord. So when he puts that rainbow up in heaven around his throne, guess what? He is reminding himself, not just on the earth, Every time there's a storm or a rain, it's also up in heaven. It's going there like 24-7, that rainbow. That's God's mercy and grace. Revelation chapter 4. And then we'll notice at verse 3. And he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone, and there was a rainbow round about the throne in sight like unto an emerald. So that's around God's throne right now. He has that. If we look at Ezekiel chapter 1, Ezekiel saw a bit of that. Notice in Ezekiel chapter 1, he saw the floor of heaven. Look at verse 26, verse 26. And above the firmament that was over their heads was the likeness of a throne. So this is above the firmament. This is not just the clouds that we see. All right, so there's another rainbow up there that's above the firmament. Uh, was the likeness of a throne as the appearance of a sapphire stone, and upon the likeness of the throne was the likeness as the appearance of a man upon it, and I saw as the color of amber. Look at verse 28. As the appearance of the what? Bow that is in the cloud in the day of rain. So Ezekiel saw that, but he was seeing it from the floor of heaven itself, down on the earth. He saw something above the firmament. So he saw... An aerial view, John, he saw a vertical horizontal view, like right in front of him. Now let's look at uh, Revelation 6, Revelation 6. Now we know that's, and then 2 Corinthians chapter 11, 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Let's wrap it up here. If we're going to know a being that would like to imitate God, steal the things of God, take the things of God, it's going to be pretty obvious. It's going to be Satan, right? So then, it, would it be a surprise that Satan, he would try to take the bow for himself? It won't be a surprise if he would try to do that. Because why? You see one example. Let's see uh, how Satan uh, disgraced God's symbol or stole it for himself. One, we see the sodomite agenda, right? So we see the sodomite agenda over here. And then the second one is that he likes to morph himself into an angel of light. And that's what a rainbow does, how we get the light. It goes through all those spectrums of colors, right? So let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 14. Notice that he is not an angel of light. He morphs himself, transforms himself. That means he's fake when he's doing this. When a person transforms or changes into something else, that means they're a fake so we see here he's a fake light, 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen, And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Notice the context is actually fake. Look at verse 13, false, right? See that? So it's putting on a show, pretentious, false. 
Let's look at Revelation 6. Revelation 6. It is possible there could be a double meaning here. There might be a, two different meanings behind this word, not just one. When the Antichrist comes out, we know that he comes out uh, not with an arrow, but just a bow itself, right? Why? Try to show that he's not of war, but just a man of peace. But that's fake, right? He has that bow with him, kind of like Nimrod, right? So he's coming forth conquering and to conquer. But it could give a different meaning too. It could give a different meaning that uh, he might be carrying that rainbow with him as well. You might say, why? Because the rainbow is supposed to represent peace to our world today. Inclus uh, being inclusive to everybody. Multicultural. United Nations. You know that? It's, they, they all, the world, when they see the symbol of a rainbow, the first thing in their mind is not God's promise in being gracious over their sin. It's that we should tolerate all these sins and differences. See, that's a sick mind. That's a sick mind. So the Antichrist, he can use that for himself. Revelation chapter 6, and then we'll read verse 2. And I saw and behold a white horse, and he that sat on him, that's the Antichrist, had a what? Bow. Just like the same word in Genesis 9, bow. What Ezekiel saw, bow. So that's very interesting. Uh, we're not going to turn to this passage, but uh, Daniel chapter 11, the Antichrist says that he has no desire of women. So it might show right over here that he might have some kind of sodomite inclination there. All right, so uh, we finished our Genesis study. We will continue on uh, in our Genesis study next time. Let's close with a word of prayer. Father God, I pray that today's teachings have uh, increased the knowledge of the scriptures and an appreciation of your words, and we've learned a lot more. And people who keep saying that the Bible is so hard to understand, when they first get saved and pick up that King James Bible, sometimes the wording, they're not used to it, and it can be hard to them. But I pray that by studying the Scripture, every single word, explaining every word, it given them a common sense just now, and they're able to take in the milk and the meat of the Word, and now they're able to intake it for themselves. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.